In the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, in the episode Symbiosis, the Enterprise answers a distress call and finds itself entangled in the affairs of two neighboring planets. Eventually, it's revealed that the inhabitants of one planet are severely addicted to a drug produced by the inhabitants of the other planet. Captain Picard decides that he cannot intervene to correct this obviously exploitative relationship because to do so would violate the Prime Directive. At the end of the episode, as Picard is preparing to leave the solar system, he and Dr. Crusher have a scene in the turbo lift that goes something like this. Seems like we should have done something to help that planet full of suffering drug addicts we just left. Nope, you're wrong, and I'll tell you why. Halt turbo lift. Oh, here we go. The Prime Directive is more than a rule we're supposed to follow. It's a philosophy, and a good one. History shows that whenever an advanced civilization interferes with a less advanced civilization, no matter how good their intentions are, it always goes horribly wrong and ruins everything. What about the Vulcans guiding the development of Earth following first contact? That's not canon yet! Look, the Prime Directive is there for a reason. Did I mention what history shows us? Because I can go over it again. Dude, I'm a doctor and a commander in Starfleet. I know about the Prime Directive. Why are you lecturing me like I've only just heard of it? I just think it sucks that we're leaving all those people to deal with the pain of their addiction and withdrawal. Yeah, well, we're leaving now and we're never coming back, so it's whatever. Resume turbo lift. Oh, tell me you did not just resume turbo lift your way out of a conversation with me. I think Picard is actually less condescending in my version. He was a prick in the first season. His odd decision to respond to Dr. Crusher's compassion for his suffering people with a grandstanding little speech notwithstanding, Picard in that scene actually gives a pretty good summary of what the Prime Directive is and why it's important. Unfortunately, the producers of Star Trek aren't always so clear and consistent when it comes to their depiction of Starfleet's General Order No. 1. That's why, despite how reasonable Picard makes it sound, I sometimes find myself questioning whether the Prime Directive is such a great thing after all. It's a question I'll explore a bit further in this video, which I'm calling Why the Prime Directive Might Actually Be a Terrible Rule. The concept of the Prime Directive was introduced in the classic Star Trek episode The Return of the Archons, where, in a sign of things to come, Captain Kirk violates it a few minutes after Spock mentions it for the first time. But Kirk had a good reason for violating the Prime Directive. Or at least he thought he did. And that's really the only reason the Prime Directive is there. To force the Captain to make a choice. To follow the rule, or to do what he knows in his heart is right. But it's not automatically a bad rule just because the Captains have broken it a lot. In fact, as originally conceived, it's a pretty good rule. At least in theory. In Return of the Archons, Spock makes reference to the Prime Directive of Non-Interference, and usually when a Star Trek character cites the Prime Directive, that's what they're talking about the general order that forbids Starfleet personnel from interfering in the internal affairs of other civilizations. That's a good rule, for the reasons Picard cites in Symbiosis. Meddling in the internal affairs of another society, no matter how well-intentioned, almost always produces disastrous results. And this was more than an intellectual abstraction. Remember that the original Star Trek was produced during some of the bloodiest years of the Vietnam War, a period when more and more Americans were beginning to feel strongly that it was not the place of their country to try and dictate the affairs of other countries. The original Star Trek referenced Vietnam multiple times during its run. It's reasonable to assume there were at least a few writers on that show who wished the United States had its own prime directive and followed it. Unfortunately, the more we learn about Starfleet and how it operates, the more complicated and ethically dubious its commitment to the Prime Directive starts to seem. These complications really start to pile up in the Next Generation era, but they have their beginnings in Classic Trek. At some point, one of the writers or producers must have noticed that pledging to uphold a non-interference principle is kind of an odd thing for people to do when their primary mission is to seek out new life and new civilizations and you know the rest. So the meaning and application of the Prime Directive was tweaked a little to allow the crew of the Enterprise to do the thing that was the entire basis for their show. In the second season episode, Bread and Circuses, Kirk and McCoy summarize the Prime Directive as demanding no identification of self or mission, no interference with the social development of said planet, no references to space, or the fact that there are other worlds or more advanced civilizations. There you go. Visits are okay. Just try not to let them see you. Don't tell them who you are if they do see you. Don't mess with their society and keep your trap shut about outer space and aliens and stuff. 
How hard is that? Well, like I said, the complications kept piling up. In Star Trek The Next Generation, the observe but don't be observed interpretation of the Prime Directive was cited as justification for the Federation's use of holographically concealed duck blinds to do anthropological research on pre-warp civilizations. Every time we see one of these duck blinds, something goes horribly wrong. But that's not really the point. After all, Star Trek is an action-adventure show where something going horribly wrong is the catalyst for the plot of almost all of the episodes. If something didn't go horribly wrong at some point, it probably wouldn't be a very exciting hour of television. The crew of the Enterprise visits a remote outpost where scientists are secretly observing a primitive society, and everything goes pretty much as planned. Don't miss the next exciting episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. The point is, studying less advanced civilizations in secret so as to avoid influencing the development of their society seems scientifically sound. The civilization being studied is allowed to develop without outside interference, and researchers are able to learn more about how societies grow and evolve. It's win-win. But is it ethically sound? The ethical issues don't become apparent as long as the society being studied isn't in any danger. But what if a natural disaster threatens to destroy it? A disaster Starfleet can mitigate or even prevent entirely. Does following the Prime Directive mean allowing a society in such a predicament to suffer the disaster and possibly be destroyed? Apparently it does. In the TNG episode Homeward, Captain Picard allows the Baralan civilization to die when its planet's atmosphere goes bye-bye. A small group of Baralans are saved thanks to Warp's brother Nikolai Rozhenko, but Nikolai acts in defiance of Captain Picard's orders and is clearly presented as having violated the Prime Directive. Pretty much everyone else on the ship is super annoyed at Nikolai, even Worf, who's like, I can't believe you broke the Prime Directive and neglected your duties as a scientist. And Nikolai's like, oh, the Universal Translator must be malfunctioning because that's a really strange way of telling me I'm a hero for saving all those lives. And the thing is, by the end of that episode, Worf has come around to his brother's side of things. He's still a stickler for the rules, but he comes to recognize that Nikolai did the right thing by violating the Prime Directive to rescue some of the Baralans. And that's not just Worf being led by his heart rather than his head. There's something terribly cold-blooded about choosing to involve yourself with a society, even if it's just as an unseen observer, and then standing by and doing nothing while that society is wiped out of existence. Of course, the Baralans aren't really the best example to use here, because their entire planet was rendered uninhabitable by a natural disaster, which apparently even the advanced technology of the Federation was powerless to prevent, and it just wasn't logistically feasible to relocate the entire planetary population somewhere else. And the few Baralans who did survive only survived because they happened to be in the group that Nikolai became involved with. All the other Baralans on the planet still died. That doesn't seem fair. A better example is what Captain Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise do in the opening sequence of Star Trek Into Darkness. They intervene to prevent a volcano from erupting and destroying a pre-warp civilization living on the planet Nibiru. Eventually, Kirk is forced to reveal their presence to the indigenous people in order to rescue Spock, but the plan going in was to kill the volcano in secret and leave without the Nibirans ever knowing they'd been there. However, when the Enterprise returns to Earth, Admiral Pike scolds Spock for trying to get around the Prime Directive on a technicality. Apparently, even if the mission had gone according to plan, stopping the volcano from killing the Nibirans would have violated the intended spirit, if not the exact letter, of the Prime Directive. But wouldn't allowing an entire civilization to die a preventable death violate the spirit of the Prime Directive too? The rule was established to discourage Starfleet from contaminating less advanced cultures, but isn't utter destruction worse than contamination? Hey, don't make that face at me, Pike. I'm just asking questions. And let's not forget, the no identification of self or mission portion of the Prime Directive doesn't apply to all non-Federation societies, just to the ones that haven't yet developed warp drive. Which, on one hand, makes sense. After all, once a species learns to travel through space faster than light, it doesn't really make sense for all the other warp-capable species to hide from them. But on the other hand, the development of warp drive seems like an arbitrary line to draw. Dude, seriously, calm down.
Stressing out like that'll put you in an early grave. As we know from Star Trek First Contact, the Vulcans revealed themselves to the people of Earth like a few minutes after Earth's first ever warp speed flight. And as we know from Enterprise, which begins about a hundred years after First Contact, the Vulcans took a very active role in guiding the development of Earth. And despite some understandable and possibly justified resentment on the part of some humans, it seems like that worked out pretty well for Earth. I should also mention that the Prime Directive doesn't stop the Federation government from meddling in the internal affairs of planets that fall under its jurisdiction. Remember the conflict with the Maquis? That rebellion of colonists along the border between Federation and Cardassian space that began because the Federation gave their planets away to the Cardassians? Let's just review a little bit of what you're signing up for when you enlist in Starfleet. You have to let all these people die when a volcano fries their planet because, hey, it's wrong to interfere in the internal affairs of other societies. But if the Federation Council decides it's a good idea, you also have to kick these people off their land. Do either of those things seem right? The legal and moral complexities that govern when to intervene in the affairs of another society and when to sit back and watch them all go extinct are touched on in several Star Trek episodes but are never really explored in depth. And that's because the Prime Directive wasn't invented in order to allow the writers of Star Trek to interrogate the values of the Federation. It was invented in order to give the heroes a rule they had to decide either to follow or to break. Like many elements of the franchise, the Prime Directive started out as something relatively simple and grew into something almost incomprehensibly complicated due to the fact that people have been making Star Trek for over 50 years and every writer has their own ideas about how tropes like the Prime Directive ought to be used in order to craft the best possible story. That's why in some episodes, the Prime Directive is a rule that prevents the heroes from doing the right thing, which should obviously be broken. And in other episodes, it's a rule that reminds them that sometimes doing their duty as Starfleet officers means not being able to do what they think is the right thing. And sometimes it means letting millions of people die from a disease you have the cure for because, hey, we're not out here to play God. Isn't that right, Jonathan? I know, I know, technically the Prime Directive doesn't exist yet when that story takes place. Maybe Dear Doctor isn't so much the origin story for the Prime Directive, but the explanation for why the Prime Directive is so weird and inconsistent. Hey, yeah, that must be it. <laughs> I guess it all boils down to this. Why might the Prime Directive actually be a terrible rule? Because it's vague, and it's contradictory, and it invites conflicting interpretations. The don't interfere in the internal affairs of another society bit is good. The stand by and allow an entire civilization to perish from something you could prevent, even if you've been secretly observing that civilization for years bit. Not so much. This concludes my presentation. So, how many times have you broken the Prime Directive since we hung that planet full of drug addicts out to dry? Eight? Nine? Can we not do this first thing in the morning? What? I'm just wondering. Fine. You sit over there and wonder. I'll be over here eating my breakfast. Assuming I can figure out how I'm supposed to eat this bizarre alien culinary monstrosity you made for me. Jean-Luc, that's a waffle. Hey there, Trek Actuarians. Can that be a thing? Never mind. Hope you like this one. I just wanted to drop in here at the end to let you know that the subject of the next Trek Actually video will be one of my favorite characters, and perhaps one of yours as well, the one and only Lieutenant Barkley. Look for that one coming up in a few weeks, and thanks for watching.